now for some analysis on China's economic growth. We spoke to Yukon Huang, who's a senior fellow on researching at China's or researching China's economic development for the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace here in Washington. These month-to-month -month indicators are never fully consistent and they can reverse themselves. But the fact that the inflation rate has stayed relatively low and that the, uh, the primary, uh, the purchase industrial, primary industrial indicators, uh, the rate of decline of prices has leveled off is also good. Export and trade figures are also somewhat encouraging. But I think sometimes you read the wrong things into these messages. Uh, export numbers are up higher, but import growth has been actually subdued. Actually, in my view, the import number is more important because the important number is a sign of what's going on domestically. Right. I want to refer to an article which was written by Premier Li Keqing, which was published in the Financial Times, in which he stated that the government has defined, quote, unquote, lower limits, which are intended to ensure steady growth uh, and uh, employment. Uh, what's your interpretation of that? Well, I think the significance of the article is that the government feels the pressure to actually uh, assure everyone that the growth rate of the economy is going to be around 7.5% for this year, which is the target. Since markets have been feeling rather negative and worried that, in fact, the decline could even be more serious than they anticipated. I think it's a bit of a shame, actually, because the real issue is not whether growth is 75 or 7.2 or 3, or even whether it hits a 7.0 this year. The real issue is whether or not they can provide what I call a steady and reliable uh, base for continued growth in the coming years, so that the, by the end of this decade, uh, China is doing reasonably well. And for that to happen, it may in fact be necessary for the growth to actually come down a bit more. So what do you think would be the possible solutions that the Premier would be looking at? So the first thing we have to do is to recalibrate our expectations. China is not going to grow at 10%. It shouldn't grow. It doesn't need to grow at 10%. Its labor force is actually shrinking. Uh, so it doesn't really have to worry about job generation as it has in the past. What it really needs to worry about is increases in productivity, continued sustained growth in wages so living standards improve, and it's a major challenge how to improve, for example, all the huge numbers of college graduates who are now coming out of the, the education system who are having difficulty finding jobs. The manufacturing workers, the semi-skilled workers, they're actually still in very short supply and they're in great demand. So the nature of the economy, the challenges facing the economy are different. And if we look at some specific sectors, if we look at land, for instance, or property, prices are booming. Is there a danger here about the property bubble? There is a concern here. Uh, the problem is not property bubbles in the big cities. The problem is overbuilding and potential speculation in some of the more smaller or medium-sized cities in some of the uh, western regions where they've created what I would call these very famous, by now, ghost cities, uh, where entire blocks of housing, commercial property is totally unoccupied. That is where the concern is. Uh, it's not the, the, not the big cities in China. So with that concern in mind, do you think the government will take uh, stronger control, a tougher hand in this? I think the best thing Chinese government could do, actually, is to remove the restrictions of moving money out of China so firms and households no longer find it necessary to invest only in property in China, but they could actually buy property or invest in markets outside of China. I think that would be good for China and better for the world. I want to turn to one final issue, and that is an issue that has been getting a lot of press, and that's the issue of the anti-corruption drive, which has been uh, launched by the uh, new administration in China. Um, how do you think it's going to play out? I mean, are we going to see a lot of restructuring here? Uh, you have to eliminate the restrictions and controls that encourage, con encourage corruption. Corruption comes from many, many aspects. For example, uh, you need budgetary processes which are more transparent. Right now, much of the activity is channeled through the banks where not much is well known. The bidding processes for government contracts are not transparent or open in many ways. There are too many controls, and every time there's a control, there are bribes being paid. Officials have been asked, for example, to declare their assets, but in most of the areas, they've not done so. But also, to make this uh, realistic, you have to also ask the question, are government salaries too low? Many of these officials have responsibilities which are enormous by Western standards, yet their compensation is really minute. In that kind of system, you can't have a compensation system which is not, not commensurate with the risks that these people have to undertake and the responsibilities. So you have to base a just compensation salaries in the public sector also. That was Yukon Huang talking to me earlier. Well,